mental health has been deteriorating worldwide beyond the expected. As an example, the World Health Organization in the 1990s forecasted that by 2020, depression would become the second leading cause of disability throughout the world. However, the same organization in October 2012 reported depression as the major cause of disability worldwide. And this growth goes for other mental disorders as well. In the USA alone, one in five adults live with a mental illness. Sadly, only 44% receive treatment, and that is because the USA represents high-income societies. When we look at low- and middle-income countries, between 76% and 85% of people with mental disorders receive no treatment for their disorder. What are the most common mental conditions, and how do they affect one's life? Depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, dementia, post-traumatic stress disorder, substance use disorders, and developmental disorders such as autism spectrum, cerebral palsy, fetal alcohol spectrum, and intellectual disability count among the most widespread conditions. Some are more obvious than others, some are more incapacitating than others, but all these conditions significantly affect thoughts, perceptions, emotions, behavior, and relationships. The growing numbers of people who are affected, along with the nature of these problems, translate into serious suffering. Why? Firstly, because they feel the pain of their symptoms as much as those afflicted by physical maladies. Secondly, because even though reliable forms of effective treatment exist, only a minority receive treatment. And thirdly, and perhaps unconsciously and unintentionally, we all stigmatize, prejudge and discriminate against these people. As a result, Persons suffering from these conditions may not gain access to the privileges, opportunities and rewards that every human being deserves. We believe that affiliation to caring communities is one of the most necessary and satisfying experiences. This includes belonging to and being accepted and embraced by the church family. This is the core of mental health and wellness within Adventist Possibility Ministries. Those with mental health conditions, as well as those caring for them, are subject to a great deal of stress, feelings of alienation, embarrassment and isolation. That is why Christians must reach out to them, show acceptance, provide support and offer opportunities for these individuals to belong and to contribute to the community. This is what Jesus did when he encountered people who suffered from mental and physical illness. What are we doing at Adventist Possibility Ministries to accept and support those with mental illness? We are heightening the awareness of this issue among church members, local church leaders and church administrators in order to displace misinformation and promote a more caring attitude towards people with special needs in the area of mental health. We are inviting individuals from the local church to the division level to provide a welcoming environment to those with mental difficulties that includes access to all possible areas of church life. We are informing and educating God's family to be inclusive in principle and practice welcoming those with mental special needs into church committees, forums, volunteer service opportunities and other ministries according to their potential. We are appealing to various levels of the church organization to identify and provide emotional and material support to meet the needs of those who struggle with mental health. We are producing educational materials and holding public events to promote the restoration of dignity and personal worth in the individuals served, helping them discover their hidden talents in order to use this in the service to others. We strive to ensure that soon our church will be a place where those with mental illness will be welcome and intentionally included in appropriate activities, a place where they will learn about Jesus and the good news of salvation, and a place where they will enjoy the love and peace that only Jesus can offer. Uh, thank you very much and uh, good evening, everyone. Am I audible? Good evening. Yes, yes. Thank you, everyone. Uh, those of you who are watching us from YouTube, where I know majority of us are, uh, and those of us who are watching us from Facebook, and those of you who will be watching us and listening to us from Zoom, we really want to welcome all of us to this evening uh, presentation. This week uh, has been and is still going to be the Adventist Possibilities Ministries Week and Children at Risk. And uh, we are privileged to have uh, uh, two pediatric um, consultants who will be able to um, take us through uh, various topics. And the first topic for this evening will be autism. 
uh, this is uh, what we call a developmental disorder that of course affects the uh, nervous system, you know, and I believe that a doctor here will break those terms uh, in a very simple manner that will identify with all of us. So uh, before we continue and introduce the speaker, allow me to uh, invite uh, Elder Kerama to kindly offer a word of prayer. Elder Kerama, please. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we come before your presence this evening. We are grateful for the opportunity that you have given us to share in your word. As we get our teaching this evening from our colleague, Dr. Gufana, we pray that you may be with her. May you lead her and may the presentation be enriching to us. We even want to pray for those of us who have not yet joined. May you kindly enable them. We thank you and we honor you. And we thank you because we have heard and answered our prayer. For we have prayed in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Elder Kerama. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we come before your presence this evening. We are grateful for the opportunity that you have given us to share in your word. As we get our teaching this evening from our colleague, Dr. Gufana, we pray that you may be with her. May you lead her and may the presentation be enriching to us. We even want to pray for those of us who have not yet joined. May you kindly enable them. We thank you and we honor you. And we thank you because we have heard and answered our prayer, for we have prayed in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So uh, allow me to introduce Dr. Agufana so that she's able to uh, present, and then we'll have some 15 minutes for questions. So welcome so much, Datari, and take us through the presentation. Karibu sana. Thank you so much, Willis. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, thank you, members of Creta and friends of Creta, for having me this evening. I have been to Creta before several times, and I, I have felt your warmth and your hospitality the few times I have been there. And I'm happy to see some of my friends as participants. I'm happy to see Jerry Maosa, who is a very good friend of mine. And I am seeing um, Misati, who I think I know. Uh, so thank you so much for welcoming me. I hope I will be able to share my screen. Oh, host, uh, you may need to enable me to share my screen so that I can present uh, the work that I have. It's on PowerPoint. So kindly host, if you are able to allow me to share my screen. Yes, thank you. Okay, so I hope we can see what is, what is happening. Um, so we are going to talk about um, autism and I hope we are following. Uh, I will share these slides by email to the church email once it's availed to me so that those who uh, may need a record or uh, something to refer to can get it. So you don't need to make any notes unless it's something very, very important. Okay. So what is autism? Uh, autism actually has been uh, renamed. Currently, we know it as autism spectrum disorder, and it comprises a group of disruptive neurodevelopmental and behavioral disorders that range from mild or high functioning to severe. So when you hear the word uh, group, it means that it encompasses many different types of presentation and many different types of children. When you hear neuro, always think of the brain. And when you hear about development, it means the process that the brain takes to mature from the time of conception in the womb to the time of death, you know, God forbid. Okay, so as you can uh, describe, get from the description that this disease affects the brain development or the brain maturation. And then it manifests itself, it's itself in the behavior of the children who are affected with autism okay and the reason it is called a spectrum just like the way uh, you have a rainbow you know the rainbow is also a spectrum and I was hearing somewhere uh, somebody telling me telling us that a uh, the rainbow is actually different versions of the same color you know how the rainbow is formed when light uh, when the sun strikes the light at a certain angle 
it reproduces all those colors, the seven colors that we call the colors of the rainbow. And that's exactly how it is with uh, autism spectrum disorder. It is the same disease, but the presentation may vary such that somebody may not even appear to be autistic or may not even appear to have the, the signs or the symptoms that we, we use to label people as autistic. That's why we call it a, a spectrum. So the challenges that these children usually have are observed in their manner of speech. Uh, it is also observed in how they interact with others, how they handle their emotions. Some children's intelligence is also affected, so their education may be a challenge, and also how they behave. Sorry for the typo there, supposed to be spheres. Um, so we commonly see autism in boys more than girls. The ratio is four to one. So uh, out of all the children with autism, uh, autism spectrum disorder, uh, three quarters of them, or let's say a, a, a four or five of them will be boys, and then a fifth will be girls. One of the reasons for this is that autism appears to be passed through the X chromosome. The X chromosome, as you know, boys are XY. So if a boy, a boy, uh, if there's a, re a relative in the boy's family who had autism before, and if that relative happens to be a woman, the chance of passing it to a boy child is higher because the boy child only gets one X chromosome, but the girl child gets two X, X chromosome, one from the father and one from the, from the mom. So if the father's side did not have autism, it's unlikely that the girl will get the, the autism. I don't know if you understand that genetic uh, uh, genetic variation or that genetic uh, inheritance. So it is more common in boys than in girls. And another reason why we see it more commonly in boys than in girls is that somehow when girls are shy and quiet, people tend to say, ah, that's a good girl because she's quiet, she doesn't talk. She doesn't even want to play with other children. Ah, she's a good girl. Somehow shyness and quiet is admirable in girls. But when a boy is shy and quiet, all of a sudden the whole community is up in arms, wondering why this boy is quiet. Because everybody wants the alpha male. Everybody wants their son to be strong and masculine and fighting everybody on the streets. So when they notice a boy is a bit more reserved, then they worry. And when that worry becomes... Um, you know, significant, they take that boy to the hospital and sometimes that boy is diagnosed as to be autistic. But girls, when they are quiet and they don't talk to people, nobody bothers. They say, ah, that's a good girl. She'll not give us trouble. She is a good girl who will sit at home and do the housework. So that's one of the reasons why we notice more boys than girls get autism. As we've talked about it, uh, usually it is transferred genetically. So usually you find that there was somebody in the family that had autism before. And that's why this child probably inherited this gene from this person who had um, autism. Uh, sometimes people say when they come to the clinic and they, they diagnose the child as having uh, autism spectrum disorder, they say, no, 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 no one in my family has ever had autism. Where, where is this coming from? I have never heard of anybody uh, who had autism. So what I usually ask is uh, instead of we using the word autism because the word autism is a recent term. So you just ask general questions where that, you know, is there anyone in the family who, who talked late? Maybe they talked when they were five years or seven years and they say, yeah, yeah, there's an uncle I had who took too long to speak. This, and they say, okay, that could be a clue that that person may have had autism. You ask questions, is there somebody maybe who had a challenge in their education? They say, yeah, there's somebody who never did well in education, they never finished standard eight, and they say, okay, that could be another clue. Then you ask, is there somebody who, who never liked to interact with other people, he just liked to be alone? And they say, yes, yes, there could have been somebody like that. So if you use the word autism, people will say, no, nobody in my family has ever had autism. But if you describe the disease, they'll tell you, yes, my uncle or my grandfather or my brother delayed to talk and something like that. So we do not know the cause of autism. Uh, I know there are many speculations in the streets. <laughs> Let me use the word streets. However, the cause of autism is unknown, okay? Autism usually starts from conception. So somebody who is autistic, it started from the time they were conceived. It did not start later after being born like an infection where they picked somewhere. 
and it usually lasts up to adulthood although many people can learn how to cope and how to live with autism such that by the time they are adults you may actually not know that these are people who are autistic many times when we are discussing diseases we like to focus on what people cannot do uh, but now that we are in the era of possibilities and in the era of uh, celebrating people's strengths I'd like to start by what these people are able to do, uh, what are their abilities and what are their, their strengths. And most children with autism actually have no limitation when it comes to understanding. They are very intelligent. Actually, some of them are highly intelligent, even more intelligent than what we call normal children. Uh, most of them can understand almost all the concepts that are taught to them in school. Most of them can understand instructions. Most of them can play a musical instrument, they can learn a new skill. So very few have what we call um, cognitive def deficits or cognitive uh, challenges. Most children with autism are very highly adaptable, which means they can conform to the situation. If they are left in an environment where maybe people um, uh, eat on the floor, within a few weeks, the autistic child will have adapted to that and will also be eating on the floor. So they adapt very easily to changing situation and changing environments. They are trainable. Some people tend to think autistic children cannot sit in a class, cannot attend school. That is a lie. Autistic children can be trained. They can learn new skills and they can actually uh, benefit from education. They usually have a heightened sense of smell, texture and sound. So an autistic child will be able to tell that something is burning even before the person who is cooking the food smells that something is burning. They are very sensitive to texture. They can tell a cotton material from a wool material just by touch and they don't need any other information and they're usually right. They're also very sensitive to sound and they can pick very high frequency sound and low frequency sound. So they are very sensitive to sound. They can perform almost all the tasks that normal people perform, although sometimes it may take a little bit of training and a little bit of patience, but they actually can perform all the tasks that normal people can perform. They can take themselves to the toilet, they can brush their own teeth, they can brush their own hair, they can dress themselves, they, uh, they can uh, have a job, they can uh, apply themselves in a career, they can have families, they can have children, normal children, Literally, they can do almost anything that normal people do. Uh, of course, they may need a few accommodations. They may need a, a, a little bit of help, but they can do almost everything that normal people can do. Another good thing about uh, children in the, in the spectrum is that they are ambulant and they are dexterous. This means they can walk, they are mobile. You don't have to buy a wheelchair for them unless they have other uh, diseases underlying. They can, they can feed themselves. You don't have to feed them. They can write, they can play, they can use their hands, they can be helpful in the house. So both their big muscles and their small muscles are efficient. They also have a great appreciation for art, music, and repeated physical acts. So a child uh, who is in the spectrum, for example, if you have a farm, a child who is in the spectrum will be of great help in slashing the grass because they love that repeated, repeated action of slashing they love it or, or you know, uh, digging. If, for example, you have a farm and you are planting maize or beans, an autistic child will be of great help because they enjoy the repeated action of, of, of digging, okay? So let's see what, what differentiates uh, children in the spectrum from other children. Physically, um, autistic children look normal physically. If you look at an autistic child on the face and in the hands and in the legs, do not expect to see anything abnormal. They look just as normal, just like any other child. However, some children may have a bigger head, but it requires a very keen eye to notice this. Um, they usually start having uh, you know, bigger heads, slightly bigger, not extremely huge. But if you compare with their peers, you might find that children in the spectrum, their heads are a bit bigger. And this is because the brain of an autistic child usually has a bigger volume than those uh, of normal children. Their eyes and their mouths might also be slightly bigger. Then depending on whether they have other diseases underlying, because sometimes autism doesn't uh, exist on its own. 
sometimes you find there's another disease occurring together with the autism. So they may have features of another disease, you know, like for example, children with a disease we call Angelman syndrome usually have a long narrow head and then they have a, a, a broad mouth. So, uh, and then they usually have autism. So those features do not belong to autism, but they belong to the syndrome that I've called Angelman syndrome. The biggest sign or the biggest clue that usually alerts parents or relatives or uh, clinicians or you know uh, anybody that a child may be having a challenge is actually their speech. So usually this is where now parents start to, to be concerned when they realize that their child is not speaking at the time when they are supposed to speak. This is when parents start worrying and this is when they come to hospital to ask, what is wrong? My child is not yet talking. So if you trace back, you will find that children who are in the spectrum were late to bubble. Bubble is when a child uh, makes a sound like a moving vehicle. You know, like the sound an engine makes when you turn on the car. It sounds something like It usually happens at around age four to six months. And they usually spit a lot of saliva when they are doing that bubbling sound. So this is a very normal stage of speech development. So if a child delays to bubble between the age of four and six months, the child has not yet bubbled. That is a concern that should alert a parent or a clinical um, uh, personnel that something may be happening. Some children are late to say the first word. We usually expect children to say their first word between the ages of eight to 12 months. Usually the first word is a two, uh, a two letter word or a, a one syllable word. So they may say something like ma or da or ta or ba, depending on who is around them. So if a child uh, be, be after one year, one and a half years has not yet uttered their first word, that should concern uh, the, the parent or the caregiver. There are some children who come in much later where, where the parent comes in, uh, maybe the child is now five years, four years, maybe they can speak. However, they don't have a large vocabulary. So usually we prefer that children make a sentence that has the number of words that corresponds to their age. For example, if a child is four years, they should be able to make a sentence that has four words. So a four-year-old child should be, should be able to say something like, mommy and daddy went, or Ma it doesn't have to be grammatically correct, but they should be able to say something like, mimi taka maziwa iles. They should be able to at least use, make four words, put four words together to make a a sentence. So when, when you, you see that children are a bit, their vocabulary is a bit limited, in as much as they may be speaking, it's also good to seek for attention. Some children have limited sentence and phrase construction. So these are children who now come in much later, maybe by the time they are five years, six years, the teacher raises concern and says, eh, uh, so and so is in class. When I give them an assignment to, to repeat what I have said, a sentence, they are not able to. So that's when the child is brought to the hospital. By this time, usually these children are six, seven years old. They're not able to construct a full sentence. They're not able to construct a paragraph. They're not able to, to tell a story. For example, if you ask them, how was your weekend? They're not able to report how the weekend was, okay? Some children may have speech. Uh, however, they keep repeating the same word. So they may be saying something like, uh, mimi taka ball, 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 ball. So they keep repeating that ball, 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 ball. That is also something to be worried about. If they keep repeating certain um, consonants, like pa, 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 tia, mimi, pa, 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 you know, that pa, 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 it keeps repeating. That is also something to, to be concerned about. If they have to repeat instructions before they actually carry them, carry them out. Let's say you tell your child, go bring me some water. He has to say it to himself, go bring me some water, go bring me some water, and then go bring the water. If your child constantly have to repeat what you have told him before he actually carries, them, carries it out, it could be something to be concerned about. There are children in the spectrum who are speaking. Yes, they are able to speak. However, their speech is high-pitched. They speak in a soprano, and they usually the sentence is structured in a way like it's a question, yet it's not a question. For example, they can say something like, Patia mimi maji, patia mimi maji. So yes, they are speaking. Yes, you are making sense of what they are saying. However, the pitch, 
the tone, the, the, the intonation, uh, sometimes even the gestures do not make sense. Uh, so all those are things to be concerned about uh, when, when your child is learning how to, how to speak. Uh, when it comes to social interactions, this is another area where children in the spectrum really struggle. Uh, they usually have delayed or absent pointing. So there are two instances where we want children to point. We want children to start pointing at around nine months and we want them to point number one so that they are able to ask for something. So a child at nine months should be able to point at something they want. For example, if there is a, a glass of juice on the counter, they should be able to point to that glass of juice so that you, they can be given. The other reason why we want children to point is so that they can share in something that they are interested in. For example, if there's a cartoon showing on the TV, a child should be able to point at the cartoon to tell others, hey, something nice is going on, please come and see. So those are the two in instances where we prefer children to point and we want this pointing to start at around nine months. So if your child is around one year, one year, two months, they have not yet pointed, they're not able to show you something, they're not able to share an experience by pointing, that is something to be concerned about. If your child is not able to establish eye contact by one year of age, when you're speaking to a child, they should be able to look into your eyes. The reason why we want children to look into your eyes is so that they can learn human facial expressions. If a child is not able to look into your eyes, they are not able to learn the appropriate facial expressions. Maybe when they are talking, they don't know how to, when to smile. They don't know when to be sad. They don't know how to gesture the sadness and the human emotions on their face. So a child who does not want to look into your eyes, and I'm not saying all children who don't look into your eyes have a problem. I'm just saying we notice that a lot of the children with autism spectrum disorder are not able to establish mm -hmm. eye contact. Kindly let us mute. I will give a chance for question and answer at the end. Let us mute. Um, if you're talking to your child and your child appears to be unhearing, maybe they are playing, uh, maybe he's playing with some toys or he's looking at the TV and then you say something and your child, okay, looking at the TV is not a good example because all children, when they're looking at the TV, they don't hear anything. But let's say your child is just sitting and then you try to talk to them and then it's like you feel your words are just flying above their head. It's like nothing is registering, yet you know this child has the ability to, to hear. If they look far away, they just, like you're talking to them, but their eyes seem like they're in another world. Like they just seem like they're not here with us, even though they are physically here with us. If your child is extremely, extremely scared of other people, it's normal for children to be scared of people, especially from age six months to one and a half years. It's normal for children to be scared of strangers. However, if your child persists in their fear of strangers, especially if these strangers have become familiar, let's say you get a house help. The first day the child is scared, second day scared, third day scared, a month, two months, three months is still not getting used to the house help, despite the house help being a good person, not that the house help is abusive or anything, that could be something to, to worry about because children in the spectrum do not like socializing, do not like associating with other people. They prefer to be alone. They don't make friends easily. So this is a child, if you take to play in the play area, they will most likely find a corner in the play area and just play by themselves. They do not wish to say hi. They do not wish for people to say hi back to them. If you try and talk to them, they may not respond. If you try and give them a hug, they will probably push you away. If you try to shake their hands, they will probably you know, run away from you. If you try to smile at them, they don't smile back. So they're not able to give that reciprocal uh, communication. So most people get very easily frustrated by children in the spectrum. If it's a house help, they will say, ah, and then they will leave the house. If let's say you're trying to introduce them to a class, if a teacher is not aware of, of autism, uh, the teacher will probably say, so and so does, doesn't listen to me. You know, so it's, 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 it's usually something very difficult for other people to comprehend and, and, and bring on board. Okay. So in, uh, in terms of their behavior, children in the spectrum love routine. 
children in the spectrum want things in a predictable, orderly manner. So these are not children you can wake up one day and say, let's go to Shago. No, 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 no. That there will be a very big tantrum. They will throw themselves on the ground. They will shout, they will scream, they will throw things. If they're violent, they will beat you. So these are children who prefer or who are accustomed. Their brain actually is structured in such a way that they want a routine. They know they wake up at seven, they have breakfast at 7.30, they brush their teeth at eight, they do their book work at 8.30, then they go to maybe play with some blocks, and then after that they have a snack. After that they go back and maybe play with some puzzles. After that they can watch TV, then they have lunch, and then they sleep, then they go outside, then they come back and bath, eat dinner, and sleep and the next day they want the same no deviation from routine once you deviate be prepared for a tantrum be prepared for a bad mood be prepared for and cooperation from the child they also prefer short repeated acts so for example they you may find that they do something like this all the time maybe they're just seated and then they do that they just do that and you keep wondering why does he keep doing that sometimes you try to look is there an infection in the hand is it something bothering them is it a swelling but really there's nothing but they prefer to do that their brain is wired that way it's something we call self-stimulation especially when they are bored they don't know how to be bored they are not like other people who when they are bored they can stare maybe at the wall and just be fine with that. Autistic children have to have some kind of stimulation going on so they can do that or they can nod their head or they can rock their body sideways. So basically they prefer a lot of repetition. Some children also elope or wander. This is when children just run away. So these are children, especially if your child has, has this particular behavior of running away, you have to be very careful uh, because they can run away into the road uh, two weeks, a month ago, I was treating a child, an, autist, an, an autistic child who had left the house. They live in a village setting. So he had left the house, opened the gate, left the house, and then there were, and it was at night. It was dark. Nobody knew that this child had left. So uh, he couldn't see where he was going. So as he was walking, he fell into a cattle. You know where they keep the, what is it called? The, ref, the stool of cows so that they can use it as manure uh, to fertilize the ground. So he fell into a hole that was full of cattle, 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 cattle stool, cattle poop. And he was actually almost drowning. He was, he was actually, you know, because they can't talk, they can't scream. He was just doing his mouth like this. And then the cattle, the, the cow poop is just going into his mouth and his nose. So he was breathing in the poop of the cow it went into his stomach. So by the time he's coming to hospital, so luckily his mom, who knows the child has autism, went looking for him when she couldn't see him in the house. So she found him in the cattle dip and the cattle dip was high. So the boy was actually immersed in the cattle poop. Uh, so she took him out. By the time they, he came to hospital, he was having difficulty breathing. He was struggling to get oxygen. So he had to be treated for pneumonia. Luckily, he went home and he, he's fine now. But it's just to show you that these children, especially if they have this ability to run away, they can actually get themselves into a lot of trouble. These are children who take time to make friends who take time to get used to their teachers, to their classmates, to the house help. Uh, in case this is a single parent trying to get uh, remarried, this is a child who will take a long time to warm up to the step parent and the step siblings, if that's the situation that is happening. So uh, these are children who will have to be taken very, very slowly when it comes to life. Sometimes these children are physically aggressive. Not all autistic children are aggressive. However, some are aggressive. Most of them are aggressive because they are not able to express themselves, especially when they are frustrated by something, if they want something, but they don't know how to say it. And you, on the other hand, you don't understand them. You don't know what it is they want. So it creates a lot of tension. So sometimes they just, um, you know, beat, beat somebody or beat something. So some of them are physically aggressive. Some of them can destroy property, especially when they're having a tantrum during frustration or when their routine has been changed. Emotionally, these are children who have a lot of anger and emotional outbursts. 
again for the same reason that they are they may be frustrated and they do not know how to communicate that frustration so they may shout they may they, you, they may get angry and throw things at somebody you know and sometimes it's not predictable predictable so you may be sitting with an autistic child you're having fun you're okay all of a sudden excuse me all of a sudden two minutes later the child is angry is stomping the house is throwing things on the ground is beating you is yelling is screaming and you're not able to know why and how to stop it so they usually have meltdowns and tantrums all children have meltdowns and tantrums however if a meltdown lasts more than 15 minutes and if a child has more than three meltdowns in a day, that is something to be concerned about. For those who may not be parents or those who are parents a long time ago, a meltdown is basically a, a, a tantrum or a, a, an emotional expression of frustration. So children who are having a meltdown may throw themselves down, they may kick and scream, they may cry, they may yell, they may say some bad words, they may refuse to move, some children even refuse to breathe. They cry, 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 and then they hold their breath like, ah! and you might get worried that this child will actually die in the middle of the tantrum. So that's what tantrums are. These are children who also have difficulty establishing attachment. When you talk to some mothers of autistic children, they will actually tell you from the time the baby was born, they knew something was wrong. I don't know if that's the right word, but they knew that something was wrong. And if you ask them what exactly, they may not be able to say the words, but they will tell you it, they felt as if the child did not love them. So usually children should be able to develop an attachment fast with the mother, especially when the mother is breastfeeding. The act of breastfeeding is more than just for nutritional purposes. It's also for the development of attachment. And the development of attachment is a very crucial developmental milestone that determines how this child in later years will start having friends. We'll even start up uh, when they are ready to have a relationship with a member of the opposite sex, how they will approach that member, how they will function even in the marriage, should they get married, how they will function with their own children, should they get children. Children in the autism spectrum have a difficulty establishing that attachment, even with their own mom during the breastfeeding. So sometimes the baby may be breastfeeding, but he's looking elsewhere. He's not looking at the mom. The baby may appear to not want the breast milk. The baby may appear to not want to be carried even by their own, their own mom. And this is because of the difficulty in establishing attachment. They're also unable to interpret social cues. This is a child who can come to a, a funeral and start cracking jokes or start laughing. Or he, this is a child who can find you crying and then they start, you know, beating you or, you know, making fun of you because they're, it's not easy for them to see your facial expression and interpret that you are sad and therefore uh, uh, behave accordingly. So it's difficult for them to interpret social cues. And this is why most people label such children as weirdos. Uh, they call them uh, awkward. They call them, uh, you know, loners because they are not able to interpret social cues appropriately. In terms of their intelligence, as I mentioned earlier, most children in the spectrum are highly intelligent. However, if you subject them to the normal intelligence test scores, they will score poorly. And this is because normal intelligence tests will ask for verbal responses. And some of these children may be non-verbal. Maybe they don't know how, they, don't, they are not able to speak. If the test that, uh, requires them to maybe calculate some mathematics very fast, this is a child, a child who may not be able to, so they may score poorly and therefore people may label them as mentally retarded, but they are not. Just that the test that they were subjected to was not accommodative to their, their needs. So um, this is a little bit of uh, an interactive slide. So based on what I've told you about autistic children or children in the spectrum, what can you see in this child that can make you feel and make you suspect that this child may be autistic. So maybe you can just uh, raise your hand. I hope I'll be able to see if you raise your hand and I'll pick you. Or you can just speak. Has anybody raised their hand? I 
I, I am very poor at technology. I hope I can see somebody's hand that has been raised. Or you can just speak if you feel you know, you can see something about this picture that may make you suggest that this child may be autistic. Anything you can see? Okay, Boni, Morash, I can see your hand is raised. What do you think? Um, the eyesight of this child mm -hmm. looks like he's lost. Yeah, he has a far away look. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Anybody else with, a, with another answer? Anybody else? Look at where the boy is looking. I assume that woman holding the boy is the mother. And the mother looks very concerned about that boy. But the boy seemingly has no interest in the mom. He's not looking at the mom. Right? We all agree with that? Yes. Yeah, he's, 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 he's not able to, you know, his body language, you can see his body is turned away from the mom, who is, who is an, a, a, probably a source of attachment and a source of love. However, his body and his, his facial expression, he has almost a blank, a blank stare. Okay, despite looking at the mom, when you look at the mom, the mom is obviously emotional. She's obviously experiencing something, maybe something like sadness or concern. But the boy's facial expression, if, if I can rate it, is almost blank. It's almost like, you know, almost feeling nothing. Yeah, so those are some of the things that can make you consider a child as having. And it doesn't mean when you find any child looking blank, you automatically say, this is a child with autism. There are times we all have blank, blank facial expressions when you are tired, when you're stressed, when you are you're confused. So it's not that you find a child looking blank and you automatically say, that child must be autistic. Okay. So, so some of the challenges of children in the spectrum are uh, challenges start in the family. Okay. So family dynamics are affected greatly. As I said earlier, people do not understand children in the spectrum. So there'll be people in the family who will be angry at the child because sometimes they think that this child is behaving the way they are intentionally. So people will have anger towards the child. There'll be misunderstandings, especially when parental personalities. You'll find one parent is understanding and kind to the child. Another parent wants to rule with an iron fist and forcefully transform this child to be like a normal child. So there'll be misunderstandings and tension between husband and wife, between mother and house help, between mother and mother-in-law, <laughs> especially the, this, is, this is Africa and this is um, Adventist. Most Adventists come from the Western part of this country, not all, but most. And we know how people from that part of the, the country are quite conservative and quite, um, what's this word uh, that I'm looking for? They believe in a lot of uh, other things. <laughs> so you may find there may be a lot of family misunderstandings. This is when uh, villagers from the village will come to tell you, oh, you need to go and speak well to so-and-so. Siji, your grandfather had a misunderstanding or fell out with Suhu's grandfather. And so somebody was cast. I don't know, you, you need to go and talk to somebody. People will come up with very many stories. The family that has an autistic child is usually highly judged. Most people will say uh, the mother is lazy or the father is absent. Uh, that's why the child is the way they are. Uh, if it's a young family, they will be told they don't know how to discipline their children. That's why the child is the way they are. Uh, if they are rich, uh, they'll be told it's because you are rich, you are busy chasing money, that's why the child is the way they are. So a reason is never lacking, especially in the African and the Adventist setup. And then if they are eating meat, hmm, Adventists will not fail to blame all your problems on, on meat eating and coffee taking and tea drinking. So those are usually, in fact, when, when, when we see parents of autistic children, beyond just the 
challenges the child is having. The mothers and the parent, fathers are usually quite stressed because of all the pressure that they are under from the society and from the, fam from the family. Children with, in the spectrum may also have academic challenges. So they require special assistance. They need a lot of repetition. This is not a child you will just say, one plus one is two and then move forward. This is a child you will have to use blocks to show them how when you add this block and this block, you get two. You have to do it several times. You need teaching aids. This is not a child who just responds to blackboard and whiteboard. They need a lot of teaching aids. Sometimes they may need special schools with specially trained teachers who are specially trained to, to interact and um, reach certain types of children. So these are children who also have social challenges. Keeping friends is a problem. They may, if they manage to have a friend or get a friend, usually those friends fall out within a month or two because either the friend does not understand this autistic child and how they need to be talked to, or the autistic child does not value that emotional connection that maybe they have made with this friend. So keeping friends becomes difficult. When they are now, uh, when they have reached the age of marriage, these are people who might struggle finding a partner. If they do have find a partner, these are people whose marriages may be difficult uh, because they may not empathize. Let's say one partner today comes, they have lost their job. Maybe they are sad. You expect a, a listening shoulder. You expect somebody to say, oh, Pole, we, we can start a business or something like that. This is a person who may not be able to respond in the way we traditionally want them to respond because that emotional connect is very difficult for them. These are children who may get in trouble with the law. If they have a tantrum and they start destroying property or they trespass when they elope and they trespass into somebody's property and this person maybe doesn't understand that this is an autistic person, especially if now this person has become an adult, this is a child who may get in trouble with the law. Uh, Health-wise, uh, their bodies basically function normally, just like any other person. However, because of their limited self-expression, because they're not able to say, I have a headache, they're not able to say, I have a sore throat, sometimes they're not able to say, I have diarrhea, I have vomiting. So sometimes they may either be over-treated or under-treated, and sometimes they may be misdiagnosed, unfortunately. So how do we help children who are in the spectrum? Number one is to understand them and to research and learn more about autism spectrum disorder. In Kenya, one in every 10, in every 1,000 children is in the spectrum in one way or the other. So you cannot escape meeting an autistic child. I'm sure by now, most of you have met a child in the spectrum. So you cannot have an excuse of saying, I know nothing about autism. What is autism? What is this thing? So it, it behooves us as human beings and as um, conscious people to learn about autism spectrum disorder, know what it's about, know how to handle such people and know how to understand and support the parents and the families that may have a child in the spectrum. As a parent, as a teacher, as a, 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 a Sabbath school uh, you know, teacher you know, who teaches children, keep a keen eye on child developmental milestones, especially the language development and the social development. I know we put a lot of emphasis on walking and, 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 and running and sitting and controlling the head. We, we, we forget to, to look at how is a child interacting? When you are teaching that Sabbath school in kindergarten or beginner or, or PowerPoint, is there a particular child who never talks? Is there a particular child who is always in a corner by themselves? And after the class, they don't even come to say hi to either you or their friends. They don't catch up with their friends after a whole week of not seeing each other. Keep an eye on that child. Discuss with that parent. Ask that parent, hey, how is he in other classes? Is he, does he have friends? Does he play with other children? Does he speak? If a child has a high-pitched uh, you know, tone as a teacher, you don't just let it slide. Of course, you don't judge, but and you know, approach the, it with kindness and with love, but also don't let it slide because the earlier these people are identified and helped, the better their outcome is. Uh, some of the children benefit, most of the children actually benefit from speech therapy. As I said, parents are very concerned when a child is not talking. So a, a parent will actually rush a child to speech therapy even before a diagnosis is made because they really want the child to talk. So 
Speech therapy is helpful, is very, very helpful. If you have a child in the spectrum, a routine is essential. You cannot be spontaneous about their lives. You cannot just say, wake up, do whatever you want. You have to have a timetable. You have to have an hour by hour, minute by minute chronicle of what this child is supposed to be doing in class, at home, in church, the same. Play therapy is also very important. Um, I hope we don't have parents here who do not want children to play with other children. I know right now we are dealing with a pandemic, so it's a little bit difficult to have children going out, uh, especially in some communities. However, play therapy is very, very important. Play therapy is not just wasting time. Some parents think playing is wasting time. When a child is playing, they are learning how to speak. They are, they are copying how their friends are speaking. They are learning how to speak. They are learning, excuse me, they're learning how to share. They're learning how to ask for something if they need something. They're learning how to solve conflict when they fight over a toy in the play area. They're learning how to say sorry. They're learning how to wait for somebody to calm down before they start another game. So play is very important in the brain development, in the social skill acquisition. Please do not limit your child's play. It is as important as reading a book. It is as important as learning how to add one plus one. Some children may actually need to have special education and there are many schools currently that offer special education for children in the spectrum. In fact, currently even most public schools offering the CBC curriculum have a special unit that caters for children in the spectrum. These children also benefit from behavior modification. Remember we said most of the, the thing that will turn people off from children in the spectrum is usually their behavior because most people are not able to understand. They're not able to um, cope with the behaviors of a child in the spectrum. So how can we help children to um, ac acquire acceptable behaviors, especially children in the spectrum? One of the ways we use uh, is called uh, positive reinforcement. And positive reinforcement is basically rewarding good behavior. So when your child does something good, for example, if you're trying to teach your child how to say thank you after receiving something, so you tell them and you educate them on why they should say thank you. Uh, if your child is not able to verbalize it, if they're able to use a sign language, maybe even to do this. So you train them on how to do that. And every time they do it, you reward them. But reward can be something like a, like a sticker you know, just a sticker that you put in their hands or in their, on the fridge that shows that they have done something well. A reward can also be an activity. Maybe they love swimming. You tell your child, if you say thank you every day for the next maybe 20 days, you are going to go swimming. Or for older children, teenagers, uh, and this does not necessarily work just for autism spectrum uh, children, even normal children, neurotypical children, you can also reward them by giving them a token. I know most people have a problem giving money to their children. However, teenagers and bigger children benefit a lot when they are um, rewarded for good behavior and for good activities. Let's say they wash dishes, you can give them an allowance and you can agree on how much this allowance is. You can agree on how to tithe the allowance if you need that. You can agree on how to save it, how to spend it, how to invest it. And these are very uh, good uh, ways of reinforcing good behavior. Negative reinforcement also sometimes can be used. For example, if your child does not like wearing sweaters, especially autistic children may not like wearing sweaters because as I said, they are very sensitive to, um, to, to textures and sweaters have the wool. So it can be very irritating to the skin for them. So sometimes they choose not to wear a sweater. So you can uh, use negative reinforcement by actually allowing them safely without letting them get sick, but allowing them to actually realize the consequence of not wearing a sweater, which is usually to feel cold. So that is a way of negative reinforcement. So you can use both positive and negative reinforcement to help stimulate uh, good behavior, to increase their good behavior and to reduce the, the unwanted behavior. Remember to manage transitions or change of routine with prior preparations. If you have to travel to the village, start talking about it a month or two in advance. Plan it in their calendar. Let them be aware of it. It doesn't mean they won't throw a tantrum. They may still throw a tantrum, but at least it will be shorter and it will be better. 
avoid physical punishment or violence. Sometimes out of anger, people really beat these kids with <laughs> autism spectrum. Like I've seen people land on these kids with blows and kicks. Unfortunately, this does not work, especially for children in the spectrum. It is not like a neurotypical child who will directly associate the beating with whatever it is that they have done wrong. A child in the spectrum does not associate beating with a mistake. They associate beating with violence that you know you probably just have bad feelings towards them, therefore you beat them. And it usually makes them copy the same behavior. So you'll find them actually also beating other people, beating other children, because they don't make that connection that they are being beaten because they made a mistake. So as much as possible, avoid beating these children with autism, children with uh, cerebral palsy, children with ADHD or any mental illness. I actually advocate for no beating of any child past the age of seven. However, that's a topic for another day. Also avoid verbal abuse. Some parents, when they're angry with such children, they call them bad names like stupid or you're a curse or you know, you're unwanted, you're a mistake, something like that. Please do not say such things, especially if your child is a special needs child. It sticks in their minds and it kills their confidence and it kills their morale. If your child has unwanted behaviors, for example, maybe they like throwing tantrums when they don't get their way, do not give that tantrum too much attention because sometimes children want attention from us. So if you give that tantrum a lot of attention, they will know the only way to get your attention is to th throw tantrum. So they will keep doing it and keep doing it. So if, for example, you are in a room, let's say your child asks for a phone uh, or they point to the phone and they want the phone and you say, no, uh, you don't, you're not getting the phone. If you notice they're throwing a tantrum, uh, you can just turn and give them your back. You don't have to leave the room, but just show them that they are not going to get your attention that way. They will have to find another way to express themselves. Um, if they have something that they enjoy, maybe music, please engage them in music. If they have art, uh, they love coloring and painting, please involve them in that because that's how they learn how to express themselves. This is an example of uh, a chart that you can use for a child who has problems eating, especially children in the spectrum. They do not like eating certain foods. So this is a chart you can use to show them uh, how to finish their food. In the first picture, you can see there's the family eating. So you're showing them that they should sit together with the rest of the family. Then in the second picture is a girl who's feeding herself. So you're sh showing her how to feed themselves. And in the last picture is a boy who has completed everything in their plate. So every time your child does this in breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you put a star or you put a tick or you put a sticker. So basically your child is motivated to complete their food. This is a behavior incentive chart that you can use. Uh, this is for a child who can read. Uh, some autistic children can read. If they're not able to read, you can use pictures instead of words. So basically, if your child wakes up, they say good morning, you give them a tick or a star. If they say please, when they're asking for food, you give them a tick. And then you can total all the ticks and all the stars. And then you can agree with your child. Maybe if you get 30 stars or 30 points, or if you get 30 ticks, you get to go for swimming or something. So you agree with your child beforehand. And this is a good way of inspiring good behavior. If you're training them to use the potty, this is another area where parents with children in the spectrum struggle. Children in the spectrum usually do not achieve toilet training at the time we want them to. Some of them, I know one who is seven years old, they are still using diapers. Some of them use diapers for a very, very long time. So in case you are training your child to use the potty, uh, sorry, this is a bit small. I will send the slides and you'll be able to expand. But basically you can reward them. If, for example, you can just tell them, uh, you just go to the toilet, you know, or just approximate, you know, go close to the potty and you give them a reward for that. The next day, maybe they will uh, be able to tell you that I feel the urge, even if not using words, maybe using a facial expression or you twisting their body in a certain way, you reward them for that. The next day, maybe they'll be able to uh, drop their pants or drop their panties if they are ladies and you reward them for that kidogo, 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 until they actually are able to use the, the potty or the toilet. So uh, autism has no cure. 
there is no cure for autism. There's no magic pill. There is no surgery. There is no uh, radiotherapy or chemotherapy that can get rid of autism. However, uh, as I've mentioned, behavior therapy uh, is very, very beneficial for children in the spectrum. There are alternative therapies. We have hydrotherapy. Hydrotherapy is basically uh, the use of water. Uh, when children in the spectrum are in water, especially warm water, they're usually very calm. They enjoy the water. They are able to spend a lot of time in the water and that helps to calm them down, especially if they have angry outbursts or if they have limited interests in life hydrotherapy is actually very essential and very helpful for such children. Music therapy, especially if the child is musically inclined. Um, there's also some, some research into hyperbaric oxygen therapy, which is basically using high, high levels of oxygen to try and stimulate parts of the brain that may not be um, functioning as we wish them to. There's also a role for art therapy for children in the spectrum who love drawing and painting, uh, encourage it a lot, uh, let them pursue it to the maximum because this may actually be what, what is, uh, makes them uh, successful or happy in life. Uh, if you all know, uh, one of the famous painters called Van Gogh, Van Gogh actually had a mental illness called uh, schizophrenia, which is a disease where you actually believe the whole world is against you and everybody wants to kill you or hurt you to the extent that he would hear voices. And one time he cut his own ear, ear because he thought the voices were actually coming from his own ear. But if you research some of the paintings that he has done, they're actually very, very, very good paintings. So uh, art therapy is definitely beneficial for children who are inclined towards art. When it comes to diet, a lot has been said, a lot is under study, a lot is under research. Of course, ad as Adventists, we always advocate for a healthy diet that is full of vegetables and fruits. Some people speak of a diet that is uh, uh, deficient of lactose and casein. Lactose is found in cow milk and casein is found in um, some carbohydrates uh, like cheese. Uh, so some people say you should uh, limit them. However, there's uh, mi minimal, uh, you know, uh, minimal um, evidence of that. But if your child shows signs of lactose intolerance, by all means, you should avoid lactose. Um, the only thing I advise parents, especially if your child is hyperactive, some children in the autism spectrum are also hyperactive. They can't keep still. So if your child has is showing signs of hyperactive, I usually just advise on limitation of refined sugar. Uh, so diets that have a lot of juice, cakes, biscuits, um, sodas, uh, mandazis, those give very quick sugar and that gives the child more energy to continue being hyperactive. So I advise on slow release sugar and these are found in carbohydrates that have a low glycemic index uh, like uh, bananas, green bananas, uh, sweet potatoes, arrow roots, um, um, yams, cassava and the like. I hope you know this person. This person is Elon Musk. Elon Musk a few weeks ago just revealed that he has Asperger's and Asperger's disease is a type of autism spectrum disorder, a high functioning type of autism spectrum disorder. Children with Asperger's are actually able to talk. They have no limitation in speech, but they have a very great limitation in their social skills. They are not able to interpret social cues. They do not have friends, they do not make friends easily, they lose relationships, they lose friends very easily, they have a lot of repetitive acts, and they have a lot of um, things that people call weird. However, this man is the CEO of two big companies right now, SpaceX, which takes luggage and goods to the International Space Station and is paid top dollar for it. He's also the CEO of Tesla. Tesla manufactures electric cars. His net worth currently is 172 billion American dollars, not Zimbabwean dollars, but American dollars. He has seven, seven children and he has founded more than 20 startups. And all these startups have gone to be very successful. If you know of PayPal, he's one of the people who initiated PayPal. He's very famous and everything he does literally shakes the world. This is a guy who can write one tweet and the whole world can crumble. 
and yet he has autism. So do not feel that autism is a limiting disease. Do not feel that children in the spectrum cannot amount to anything. They can be very successful and they can actually achieve even more than what we call normal children. Is there autism in the Bible? Now that I'm speaking to an Adventist audience, is there autism in the Bible? Obviously, we do not know. The Bible does not say so-and-so had autism. However, there are scholars who believe that Samson may have had autism. And the reasons they say this is because he actually believed that his strength lay in his hair. Autistic children have very rigid beliefs and they do not like changing those beliefs. Like if an autistic child believes they have to use the blue spoon to eat because that is the only spoon that tastes, makes the food taste nice, you will not change their mind from that. And that belief that Samson had that his strength was in his hair and if you cut his hair, he has no more strength, which obviously does not make sense. However, he really believed it. That could be a clue that maybe he had autism. He had very difficult family relations. If you remember, there are several times he, he and his parents were not seeing eye to eye. He had to run away from home several times. He fell out with his mom several times. Uh, he had very difficult uh, relations, even with his own uh, countrymen. He went against them several times. And that, that's a characteristic of children in the spectrum. They usually have very difficult social relations. Samson also ate honey from bees that had accumulated on a, a carcass of a lion that he had killed a few weeks prior. That's not something other people would consider palatable or edible, but somehow Samson found it edible and he ate it. And sometimes some children in the spectrum can eat some things and you're like, how can you eat that? So anyway, that could be something that obviously we will ask Jesus when we make it to heaven. So basically, these are my services. I offer online and home-based uh, consultations. I do developmental assessments. Uh, I diagnose mental, behavioral, and social-emotional challenges. I do offer behavior therapy, and I offer linking with several professionals that a child may need. I also liaise with schools to maximize a child's educational experience. These are my contacts. If you do need to reach me, uh, those are my contacts on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and I do have a podcast where I talk about some things uh, about children's behavior every week. I release a podcast, so you can just Google Defaba podcast and you'll be able to see all the episodes that are here. It's audio, so you'll be able to hear all the episodes that I've done so far. So thank you so much for listening to me. If we have any questions, I will gladly answer them. Thank you so much, Daktari. That was very much informative and we are very much grateful uh, on the level of preparation that you made for this. Uh, on the chat uh, box, I can be able to just see one question being asked by uh, Enos and Enos is asking, uh, how, how do you notice autism in a child? How do you notice autism in a child? Uh, I think you had mentioned this, but for the sake of his interest, you could be able maybe to just uh, rush through maybe to be able to get, give him insight into this. Yes, Edos, um, we had already spoken about it. And one of the earliest clues you can have that a child may be autistic is actually their speech development. If a child is late in bubbling, and we discussed what bubbling is. It usually happens between the age of four to six months. So if a child does not bubble or bubbles later, if a child does not speak their first word by the time they are one year, if a child is not able to point at something that they want or to point at something that they are enjoying by the age of one year, if a child does not seem to want to make friends, does not seem to want to play with other children, does not seem to want to share their toys or ask for toys when there are other children playing with toys. If a child does not seem to share in the emotional experiences of the family, maybe as a family, you're watching a very interesting thing on TV, everybody's happy, laughing, but this child seems aloof or seems you know, like he's not present. Those are concerns and those are issues to, to, to make you um, uh, seek further attention. If a child keeps repeating the same thing over and over again, repeat, 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 and it does, it's not something that is making sense. Those are some of the early clues. 
that can give you an idea that something may be going on. Okay, I see Anne Massese is asking, which institution can an autistic child be enrolled in, e.g. a school that is affordable? I'm not sure about Nakuru. However, in Nairobi, as I mentioned, most of the public schools have an, uh, an autism center where children in the spectrum are educated uh, a bit separately from the neurotypical children by special education teachers who have been trained to reach and to uh, make special accommodations for children in the spectrum. However, I know of a school uh, called um, St. Abigail's, it's in Nairobi. Uh, I also know of a school called Akon, it's also in Nairobi. I'm not sure about, about Nakuru, but you can always, um, if you are interested in a particular school, you can always have, ask them if they have a separate unit for children in the spectrum, or you can also just uh, research and find schools that may be close to you that can um, take a child who has autism spectrum. I guess we don't have any more question unless anybody else has a question, you can just unmute on your end and be able to ask in the next few minutes. We should finish in the next few minutes. Anybody with a question, you can put on the chat or you could probably just unmute on your end and ask or, raise, or even raise up your hand on the, on the Zoom platform. Anybody? Thank you very much. Okay, my name is Nancy and I'm a parent. Who a 13 year old uh, girl with autism. Thank you very much. Actually, I just noticed it's an Akuru presentation. I'm from Nairobi. A friend of mine just sent the link. But anyway, where autism is, we learn together. So I had a question on uh, the schools. Hello? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Yes, I had a question. You talked about. Um, public schools having um, special units with the new curriculum CBC. Um, I remember in another forum, we, we had a conversation on the same and we were um, discussing as parents, basically trying to find out how this curriculum is helping our children. Because when you talk of having special units in schools, you find that uh, Autism is dealt with differently. You can't compare a child with autism with a child with um, who's physically disabled or blind. But you find that when the exams come, they do the same exam. And then when when you find uh, when you see uh, when you look at the, at the at these children, the autistic children, you find out that they they are more of uh, they are more talent oriented. Maybe in music, maybe in art. So. It has become hard for, let me say specifically me, finding a place where my child can suit because I have been in those special schools. I have been with therapists. I have been with, like, I've really tried to get a place for her. I've run a center before for two years, but I found out that for her being a, a spectrum, it was more easier for her doing home therapy and doing specific tasks that are, you know, that have been made for her needs, you see? So there's this just argument about, do these children go to the normal schools, you know, um, ha having the neurotypical kids? Do they just do the therapies? Which levels do they do? I don't know what you can advise in terms of trying to advance. I know autism is different in every child, mm -hmm. but you see, how can we help these children who are, who, who are heading to adulthood? who are supposed to be having things that they are doing to help them, you know? Yeah, so thank you. Yeah, you bring in a very, very important question. And part of, you've already answered part of, part of it, which is that children in the spectrum are very, very different. There are children in the spectrum who sit in a normal class, do the math, repeat whatever is required of them, sit an exam, do well, and go on into, the career, work life, get married, have kids, you know, basically do the works. And then there are children in the spectrum who have severe difficulty uh, understanding, uh, reciprocating, answering questions, uh, writing, uh, memorizing. Memorize. So it's 
it's very, very difficult depending on where the child is at. So uh, some schools, it's not, it hasn't taken, it, it's not a very 100% uptake, especially in the village. I know this is a big challenge, but uh, some schools have a specific center for autism where these children are not mixed with blind children, with children who have uh, hearing impairments or physical impairments or cerebral palsy. It's a class only for autism spectrum children. I know obviously the, the resources may be meager, especially when it comes to public education, resources are meager. Um, the, the approach or the, the awareness is also a challenge. Uh, so basically if I know finding a fit for your child, especially in the spectrum is difficult and it's a lifelong, it's a lifelong search until you find what exactly gives your child the best that you want for them. So some children in the spectrum as they approach adulthood, um, as I said, some children will actually achieve the daily tasks of daily living without any input from us or from outside source. However, as your child approaches adulthood from the age of about 15 to 20, because you want them also to have a smooth transition, maybe if you plan to have them move out or go into a group home or you know have some form of assisted living or get a job, they, there becomes a need to intensify their skills when it comes to life. So these are children who may need extra coaching or extra help when it comes to issues like self-grooming, cooking for themselves, uh, you know, picking out clothes for themselves, uh, how to get a bus, for example. These are children who need to be trained on how to, how do you hail a bus or a taxi? How do you go to the supermarket? How do you buy things? How do you pay for things? How do you get change? How do you walk home or get a bus ride back home? So sometimes as they approach adulthood, the focus shifts from basically having them to know the Bernoulli's principle, for example, or the, 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 the wave theory uh, or the theory of relativity. That becomes not necessary, but unless they're becoming engineers. But if now the focus becomes having these people to thrive in society, to thrive in life, to thrive in basically all things, you know, uh, that encompass the human experience. So at that time, usually we, we tend to focus on their skills of daily living, which is basically just how to feed themselves, how to buy things, <clears throat> how to make friends, how to relate to people, how to ask for help in case they're in a situation where they need to be assisted. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Maybe we can pick one more for the interest of time. Anyone else? You can unmute on your end and uh, ask your question. A quick, uh, a quick question, Dr. Tori. Yes. Um, now we, we, okay, we know you, you, you've talked about various areas. Um, if we need more resource or resource points that people would need, uh, uh, is there specific areas you can direct people for resources on, uh, on autism. In